Good morning. Travis, could you come here for a sec? You see him? It's kind of hard to miss. Huh? Yeah. That's why I chose Travis. A lot of times we're like this. We come into church and we have all kinds of things in our lives. We have people that we love and that we, we want to talk with, we want to fellowship with, and, and we forget the presence of the big guy. We forget why we're here. And we spend our service looking like this and totally neglecting the one that we should be looking at. And, and he's big and he's huge and he's right here with us. And he's hard to miss. You have to work to miss him. Thank you, Travis. <laughs> God has been teaching me. We, we know God is omnipresent. He's always here. There's nowhere you can go to get away from him. But he's been teaching me that I have to seek his presence. I have to turn my gaze to him. And, and I have to do something that is very, very difficult for me to do. And I'm, I'm guessing it's very difficult for you to do as well. I have to quiet my mind to hear him. Hmm. My mind is never still. I'm not asking that you would do this, but if you were to wake me up, I could tell you what I'm thinking. Right then. Probably, why are you in my bedroom? <laughs> but God is teaching me to take those and focus them. I'm not, I'm not very good at it. I'm getting better. I'm getting better. Because it takes practice. It takes discipline. It takes diligence. Devoting yourself to doing that. To quieting your mind. So you can be still in his presence and know that he is God. Um, that song, that last one that we did, that's Christie's prayer every morning. She wrote that in 2008. And every morning when she plays the keyboard, that's, that's one of the first songs that she does. And I can hear it from the other room. And I love the simplicity of it. I love the honesty of it. I love the openness. God, I need you. I bow before you. Nowhere in scripture do we see anyone that came before the presence of God that didn't blam, fall before him. And, and we have the audacity to come in here and be distracted in the very presence of God and we're missing the greatest thing that can ever happen in our lives. We can, we can be in the manifest presence of God and we're choosing to ignore it. We're choosing to think about pot roast and football and finances and heartache. And we're, we're forsaking what he has called us to because the one thing that God desires above all else is that we would know him and we would be known by him. <coughs> yeah, God wants you to live holy. But if you live holy without knowing him, it does you zero good in eternity. Zero good. It would be like that Pharisee that went into the temple and said, God, I thank you that I am such a righteous man. Or he can be like the tax collector that went and didn't even raise his head up. He kept his head down and said, God, forgive me, because I'm a sinner. And Jesus said, whose prayers did God hear? Who actually came into the presence of God there? 
Because I tell you, if you approach him with a haughty spirit, with arrogance, with pride, I got this, you're in a roundabout because you come in and he sends you right back out. But a broken and contrite heart, God will not despise. A broken and contrite heart, he will not despise. Uh, this morning, uh, Aaron Teal is going to come and share his testimony with us. So if you would, give him your attention. Are you bringing Zoe? Oh, yeah. Bring her. All right. <laughs> She makes sure you pay attention. Oh, yes. Yeah. She keeps me on track. I'm talking to them. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, I was uh, born in August 1983 in Salem, Oregon, and uh, spent my first few months in a town called Belsets. Shortly before they burned the mill to the ground and bulldozed the entire town. My dad, he uh, made sure I went to church on every Sunday, starting in Sunday school, <laughs> where I learned that if you ask Jesus, you get to go to heaven when you die. Well, a few years after that, I don't know who it was on TV, but they were talking about that prayer, asking Christ into your heart. And so I said the prayer. A couple years later, I told Dad, I want to be baptized. I don't remember ever being baptized, and the Bible says you should be baptized. And so I was baptized. Well, not too awful long after that came my teenage years. And the rumors are true, and what you've heard isn't as bad as the truth. Until one September morning, getting ready to start my senior year of high school, took my shower, got dressed, grabbed my books, went up to catch the news, just in time to see the second plane hit live. That July, I was in uniform and being trained. Not long after that, I was in Iraq. That December, I was escorting a convoy of munitions to be disposed of in northern Iraq. And my fiberglass Humvee was blown apart by a handful of artillery rounds wired up in a pickup truck stuck on the side of a bridge. <coughs> I seen it. Too late to avoid it. All I could do was drive by it. And just as it's passing my left side, I went, okay, here I go. And I relaxed, exhaled, heard rending metal, and then this crushing force. And the next thing I remember was inhaling the stench of ammonia and flame and dirt. And at first I thought, uh oh, where am I now? <laughs> <laughs> but it passed. The lieutenant said, and he was a few trucks behind me, he said the explosion went up and out and we were gone. That day, every single person in my truck walked away from that, and we were less than 12 feet from that blast. I came home and I bought a motorcycle during my mid-tour leave. I asked Dad if he could do me the trouble of making sure that the break-in miles were put on my Harley while I was back in Iraq. So when I came home, it would be ready for me to just ride. I crashed that bike at 90 miles an hour. I had enough time in the air to think about my landing. And what popped into my head was skiers go limp. 
And so again, I relaxed. And then I thought, I better tuck my arms in so they don't get broke off. The only injury I had that day was bruised feet from hitting the handlebars on my way over the bike. Well, not too awful long ago, I got kicked out of a room I was renting in Missoula. And I don't know if it was pride at the time or what, but I looked at what people wanted for rent in Missoula and went, no, nah, I'm just not going to pay for that. I'm, I've never been homeless. And I've never done urban survival training. And so that night, after packing all my stuff in the storage, not for lack of being able to find a place to stay, but I decided I was going to stay on the street for a while. And I started talking to people. And a lot of them are real tired of being preached at instead of ministered to. And so I started cooking meals, Terrace Park, different places around Missoula. And then people started bringing me food donations. I had more food than I could cook for people. And so I would cook a meal. Somebody would ask me questions. I'd give what answers I could. And I started studying. In October, I became ordained. Now they say a veteran is a guy who at one time, well, not necessarily just a guy, but someone who at one time in their life wrote a blank check to their country for anything up to and including their life. And it recently occurred to me, it's about time I wrote that check to Christ. <laughs> and I would like to be I would like to be anointed through this church for whatever Christ has in store for me, wherever in the world whenever in the world. And this morning as I was sitting down, I like to sit quietly and kind of listen. I catch bits and pieces of what people say. And two different people said a couple of different things in quick succession. I heard the word sacrifice, and then somebody else said, it's an essential oil. I don't know why it stuck in my head and made me grin, but I've had to fill out the rest of that. <laughs> Sacrifice. An essential oil to keep the machinery of faith working smoothly. And, amen. <laughs> So, what is it that God requires so that you can be used? Well. <clears throat> yep. God wants us to trust Him. You've heard me say it before, and I will say it, I will take it to my grave. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the call. Every one of us, if you are sitting in here today, you are called. To what? I don't know. I don't know what God has called you. There may be missionaries in here to China. There may be missionaries in here up there where Aaron was, ministering to the, the people living on the street. 
every one of us is called. And we're all called to serve. If you have this idea of ministry where, you know, you're going to go in and, and showboat it, you're not cut out for ministry. That's not what you're called to. Because the sovereign creator of the universe set for us an example as to what he wanted leadership to look like. And that leadership looks like a servant. It's somebody that lays aside all of who and what they are and what they think they are and they serve. That's the model that this church has. You see leaders in our church, you see servants. You see men in our church that are in leadership position, they're serving. Okay? And that's what I see in Aaron. A willingness to serve. Man, you lay it before Aaron, and he takes it up and goes. Aaron's got to bring in a couple of his friends that he's met. I guarantee you most of us never run into those people in our lives. Probably don't even see them when we're driving up in Missoula. It's one of those things like the park bench. If you don't need it, you don't see it. There's a lot of them up there, aren't there? Hundreds. Hundreds. Are you aware of that? Hundreds <clears throat> of people living on the street up in Missoula that are desperate for the hope that we have not to be preached at. They don't need our righteousness. They need his. They don't need our judgment. They already stand judged by the one and only judge. What can we add to that or take away from that? I would challenge you. Open your hearts. Consider. Be willing to serve where God puts you to serve. in whatever capacity you choose. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Aaron. Glenn, may I say something? Absolutely. All the while that Aaron was gone, we were praying for you in this church. God answered those prayers and protected you Okay, anybody know where we're at today? Jesus Community Church. All right. <laughs> Should have seen that coming. <laughs> Galatians, flip open with me if you would. Galatians chapter 5. Would you go ahead and put the uh, first one up? <clears throat> we have been working through the fruit of the Spirit, or, or I prefer it, a fruit of a life led by the Spirit, okay? This is the fruit of God's Spirit living in you. If your life is sealed unto Him, then this list will be exhibited in your life in some measure. The idea is that it's exhibited increasingly, not perfectly, okay? Because we're never going to be perfect in this. And I got to tell you, Satan pulled a fast one on me this week, because last week we did kindness. And the week before, I had no struggles with kindness. Didn't really even know it existed. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Sunday night, I become one of the least kind people on the face of the planet. Most of Monday, I had zero kindness. Tuesday morning, I was a stinker. And God got a hold of me, shook me up, kind of whacked me on the head a little bit. 
showed me some things in his word. I, I don't know how you guys are. I, I tend to be a perfectionist. Nothing is ever right. It's okay. And, you know, we have this big, huge picture window in the front of our living room, and it looks out and it sees the mountains and the beautiful valley, and Christy will be sitting in her chair and she'll go, wow, those mountains are beautiful. And I go, wow, it's cloudy. <laughs> Boy, there's not a lot of snow up there. But don't you think it's beautiful? I guess so. I don't, I don't tend to think of things like that. But see, being a perfectionist, when I screw up, when I make mistakes, when I fail, I'm my own worst critic. Trust me, you can't think anything worse of me than I do. And then I get unto condemnation and self-recrimination. And then I fall into despair. And Tuesday morning, I, I reached the point of despair. God, I am never, ever going to get this right. I'm, I'm just, I'm not going to get it right. God, I, 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 Tuesday morning, I didn't even want to pray. I walked out and I plopped down in my chair. And Christy looked over at me. She said, are you not going to go pray? I said, nope. Why? I don't want to. And I, honestly, my heart was, I failed him so many times, he's not going to want me back. One of these times, he's just going to look at me and say, nope, I'm done, you're out. And that's where I was Tuesday morning. And I know you guys don't struggle like this. This is, this is, this is Glenn. And I, I have a, a chair out in the back room. I, I have a deck, and that's where I usually like to spend my quiet time. It's too cold. So I put a chair by my back window so I can look at my deck. <laughs> you celebrate how you celebrate. <laughs> and I had my Bible and, and my journal, and, and I have my chair, and I have enough space in front of my chair that I can lay out before God. And, and I, that's where I have my quiet time. But I didn't go there. I went to the living room, and I plopped in my chair. And I left my Bible out there. I left my, everything was in the other room. And I, I opened up my, my iPad, and the first thing that pops up is my daily Bible reading. And, and I have several different things that I do. Um, but one of the things, I get a, a daily thing every day that helps me read through the Bible in a year. And I, I do that every year. I read through the Bible the entire Bible in a year. Then I have other reading that I do where God just leads me, okay? Um, and I looked at that and I was like, yeah, like I'm gonna read that right now. And God just kinda like took my eyes and went Dook, and stuck them. And I was stuck because uh, it was in Luke and it was talking about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son. And I, I was enthralled, and I, I've known those stories since I was little. I mean, if you grow up in church, who hasn't heard the story of the prodigal son? You know? And the, the sheep wanders off, and the, the shepherd counts his sheep, and he's missing one. And he secures the 99, and he takes off, and he goes, and he finds the one. And he grabs it and brings it back. And then he calls to all his friends and he says, come celebrate with me because the lost sheep has been found. And the woman with ten coins, she loses one. And she counts the nine and they're not there. So she lights the lamp in her house and she sets out cleaning until she finds the coin. And she finds the coin and what does she do? She calls to her friends and says, come celebrate. The coin that was lost is found. Then we have the story of the prodigal son. And everybody knows, dad, give me my portion, my inheritance. And he goes out and he squanders it and he wastes it. And he ends up feeding pigs and looking longingly at the pig food and wants to eat, and he says, well, even my father's servants eat better than this. Ding, bright idea. I'll go home and tell my father, I'm not worthy to be your son. Let me serve you. 
And so he comes home and his father sees him off in the distance. And what does his father do? He drops what he's doing and he runs. And he embraces his son. Now, a couple of things stood out in all of these stories to me. One, they stopped what they were doing until they had found what they were looking for. And it's like God just spoke into my ear. And said, I have stopped what I'm doing for you. And I'm running to you and I will not let you go. You are never so far removed from me that you can't come home. And he wrapped me up in his arms. And I just wept because I felt his love. And I, you know, I can give you clinical definitions of what love is, but I, I'm not a real good person at expressing love. Okay, I tend to keep things self-contained. And a lot of times I don't even really see love acted out. I don't really comprehend it. I don't know if that's ignorance or stupidity. I'll accept either. But I have a difficult time with the whole concept of love as it applies to me. I can look at my wife and my children and say absolutely without a doubt that I love them. How does that play out? I'm still working on that. Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday are evidence of that. But to feel God wrap his arms around me and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that no matter how far I stumble, I cannot remove myself from his grace. What can separate me from the love of God? What? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Even when I'm a stinker. Now, don't get me wrong. He chastises me. He corrects me. <laughs> We're going to talk about goodness today. All of this is leading up to goodness. Because you see, God is good. Somebody give me the rest of the quote. All the time. All the time. So, I was sharing with Jeannie before service. Uh, a few months back, you know how I am with backwards time. It could have been years ago, it could have been weeks ago. And one of my messages, I was going through the fruits of the Spirit, and I was really troubled because I was looking at the fruits, and, I, and there's a lot of them I really don't, I, I didn't understand what they were. I mean, I have this kind of um, English concept of, of the word kindness. But what, what is that? What does it look like? How is it played out? Goodness. Gentleness. There's some of them I look at, and I go, self-control. Yeah, I know what that is. I don't have it. There are others that I look at and I go, goodness, I don't know if I have it or not. Because I don't really know what it is. And this study has been absolutely amazing to me. Because English is an absolutely horrible language for conveying ideas. Right? You, do you agree? Mm -hmm. If you don't agree, in the same breath, tell your wife you love her and you love your dog. Or you love her and you love burritos. Or you love her and you love... I don't even know who's, in, who's still in the Seahawks and the, what, the Patriots. <coughs> Tell her you love the Broncos. <laughs> English is a horrible, horrible language. There's reasons for that. It's made up of at least three different languages. And we took pieces and bits and, and kind of mashed them all together. And just like America is the melting pot, English is the melting pot of languages. So I'm looking at goodness. Now last week, we looked at kindness. And I was amazed. This is the definition that I've come up with. It is the grace which pervades the whole nature 
mellowing all, which would have been harsh and austere. Okay? So it's rounding off the rough edges. And then we look at how God is kind. And this week, we're going to look at goodness. And, and, you know, there's, I'm going to read this. I'm just reading this whole paragraph. This is right out of the Oxford Dictionary, okay? This is what English says goodness is, okay? Competence, as in good at math. Reliability, good breaks. Strength, good eyesight. Kindness, good of you to come. For some reason, I always do that with a British accent. Oh, so good of you to come. I don't know why. Americans don't do that, I guess. I don't know. Moral excellent, good deeds or good works. Behavior, good child. Enjoyment, a good party. Thoroughness, gave it a good wash. Immensity in number, a good many people. Beneficence, milk is good for you. Soundness, a good reason. Expedience, Thought it good to have a try. Freshness, is the meat still good? Worthiness, good old George. <laughs> Attractiveness, has good legs, as in like a horse. <laughs> Moral rightness, did it for your own good. Promise, good news. A desirable end, sacrificing the present for future good. Favor, a good review. Do you see part of my confusion here? The fruit of the Spirit being goodness. Which one? Or all of them? This is why it's important when you are studying the Word of God to go back to the language that it was written in. Now, it used to be you had to be proficient in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek in order to be able to... You don't have to do that anymore. We have such a number of incredible uh, word study books and, and biblical dictionaries that give you insight into the word. You, you don't have to do that. You want information on some of those? Come talk to me. Come talk to Jeannie. Okay? We'll get you pointed in the right direction. But I am so grateful to God for these. Because, see, Greek is an absolutely incredible language because um, it says what it means. Now, the problem is we take what it means and we got to try and translate it into a, a language that isn't really sure what it means in anything. Okay? So, here's what the Greek word is, and I'm going to share it with you. The word is agathus. Agatha Sune, Sune, excuse me, and it means uprightness, uprightness of heart and life. Goodness, kindness, benevolence. Now it can be used in all those. Now, this word, the root, is where we get those, but this word in particular has one meaning, one application. Okay? We see the word. The root, agathu, throughout Scripture. But in the New Testament, we only see this word used once in this specific form. And it's right here. This word literally means active good. Active good. It's not passive. Last week we looked at kindness, and kindness is kind of passive. Okay, it's taking away the rough edges and letting grace replace it. All right? Goodness is action. And I've got the perfect illustration of this for you. If you have your Bibles, flip with me over to uh, Mark chapter 11. While you're flipping there, I'm going to read you a definition. Uh, this is out of Spiro Zodiati's book. 
uh, word study in the New Testament. Uh, this is what he says. Uh, While in English we have a number of pleasing qualities that are included in the definition of goodness, all that stuff I just read, in the Greek it refers to one particular quality. It is more than kreostotes, which is what we looked at last week, kindness. This is character energized expressing itself in active goodness. There is more activity in goodness than kindness. Goodness does not spare sharpness or rebuke to cause good in others. A person may display this goodness, his zeal for goodness and truth, in rebuking, correcting, or chastising. Boy, I bet you that's not what you thought goodness was, was it? I'm going to give you an example. Got Matthew 11? All right. Mark. Yeah, well, if you had Matthew, you'd be in the wrong place. Mark, chapter 11, starting in verse 15. And they came to Jerusalem, they being Jesus and the disciples. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because the crowd was astonished at his teaching. Did you guys ever look at Jesus clearing the temple as... Goodness? Because I never did. I looked at it as righteous, but I never really looked at it as goodness. Let's go back to our definition here. As soon as I find it. Character energized, expressing itself in active goodness. It does not spare sharpness or rebuke to cause good in others. A person may display goodness, his zeal for goodness and truth, in rebuking, correcting, or chastising. Now, there's one thing about this story that really jumps out at me, and this is why I chose to read this out of the book of Mark. Because, see, Jesus didn't just walk into the temple and throw a fit. He didn't just walk in and have a burst of temper. Because, back up a couple of verses. See, Jesus thought about this. He took it to God, in my belief, is he took this to God in prayer and sought the Father's will in this and then acted. Look up at verse 11. What happened? And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything... As it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. See, Jesus came into Jerusalem, and he walked to the temple, and he looked. He perceived what was going on. Now, a couple weeks ago, or months ago, I don't know, Dennis can tell you better. Uh, we were watching a Ray Vanderlaan series, and Ray Vanderlaan has a really unique take on this passage of Scripture, and I love it. Because his belief is that um, when Jesus quotes the scripture, it deals specifically with my house will be a house of prayer to all the nations. He believes that this took place in the court of the Gentiles. And that the Jews were pushing that into the court of the Gentiles because they didn't think them worthy. And Jesus was coming before them and he was ab absolutely rebuking them. Not just for what they were doing, but the manner in which they were doing it. Jesus comes into the temple and he looks around and he sees what's going on. He doesn't act right then. He leaves and he goes back to Bethany. And as was his want, this is what I am convinced of. I believe he went and he spent the night in prayer. You look over and over and over again how often at night Jesus would spend the night in prayer. He would get by himself with no distractions, and he would pray. And then he comes back the next day, 
and he's ready for battle. And he comes into the temple, and he starts overturning tables and whipping people, and he is causing a riot. What is he really doing? He's cleansing the temple. He's putting a call out to those of religious mind as to what they are supposed to be about. Now let's look at our definition again. I'm just going to read this last line. A person may display goodness, his zeal for goodness and truth, in rebuking, correcting, or chastising. Jesus wasn't frustrated or irritated. He was loving them. He was acting out of goodness. Because goodness always has, at its heart, benevolence. It always has, at its heart, love. Jesus was desperately seeking to restore those people to a right relationship with God. To get them back to understanding His holiness. The focus of their heart. Where is your mind as you're coming in to worship God? Is your mind on profit? But profit at the expense of the Gentiles and keeping yourself pure? Have you come in to worship Almighty God at the expense of others? I want to read a passage that I think really illuminates goodness. Paul's writing in Romans. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read one, one scripture. Uh, Romans chapter 15, verse 14. Paul says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. Now, I believe in this passage, Paul is very carefully laying out under the direction of the Spirit, the order in which it should go. First, be full of goodness. Then, be full of knowledge. And then, when you have those two, you are able to instruct. Now, one thing that I don't like here, the ESV has the word instruct. The NASB actually renders the word there as um, admonish. And this is another one of those Greek words that can be used in multiple different ways, but the context of, of the way that it's being used here is to instruct sternly. Look, don't do that. Do this, not that. Okay? The word admonish is a much more appropriate word here. So, first, you have to have goodness in you, and then knowledge. Now, we have a lot of people that have knowledge and try and instruct, right? What happens? Knowledge puffs up. And they come in, and they can tell you all kinds of interesting stuff, but they don't care about you. We see this in the Pharisees. How did Jesus talk to them? You go the length and the breadth of the land to make a single convert. And then make him twice the son of hell that you are. You burn him down with weights and then you refuse to help him. You bring him to the gates of heaven and then deny him entry. Did they have goodness? No. They had knowledge. And they were instructing, but they weren't doing it because of the love that God has given them, the goodness that has the other person's best at heart. So goodness first. Then knowledge. Because see, it's not enough to just have goodness. You have to have something to be able to operate from. And then instruction. Admonishment. Let me give you an example. You see somebody in a sin. 
You have goodness. You are concerned for that person. And you go to them. And you want to help them. But without knowledge, how do you help them? And are you really helping them? Poor baby. I know it's rough. God loves you. It's okay. He's going to get you through it. What does Paul say? Uh, no, confront them in their sin. Hey, you know what? God does love you. And he loves you enough that you can't do this. He has called you out of this. He wants better for you. This is not the way he has designed it to work. This robs you of God's blessing. You may be titillated in the moment. You may be tickled in the moment. <laughs> but you have robbed yourself of God's blessing in your life. Now let's look at it the other way. What if we don't have goodness? You're going to hell. Sorry, see you later. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. We don't want any sinners here. Well, all you sinners, get up and leave. And please don't, because we'd all leave. <laughs> It'd be empty. That's not a dismissal. <laughs> Goodness has got to be something that is active. Okay? This is one of the fruits of the Spirit that causes us to move. It's not passive. We don't just sit and exult in our goodness. Oh, look at me. I'm good today. I just feel goodness radiating off of me. Can you feel it? Oh, yeah, I can. You've got it too, I see, over there in your chair. Goodness just radiating. We're good together. Between us, we have much goodness. <laughs> Those poor hungry people over there. Yes, but we're so good. Yes. Right. This is what James is talking about. James chapter 2. And he's talking about your faith and what your faith is going to do. So if someone comes to you that is hungry and naked and you say, Go, I wish you well fed and warm. But you don't do anything about it? What? Good are you? Zero. None, nada, nil. The big tohu wabohu. <clears throat> Nothing. Goodness causes you to move. Not just in feeding the hungry, but in, in any action, any godly directive. Goodness is what causes you to move. It's active. It's getting out of your chair and going. It's getting on your knees and praying. It's getting on your face and interceding. It's lifting up your hands and worshiping. It's bowing your head and being humble. It's dedicating your life to being a servant. It should drive you. Go ahead and put the next one up. Character energized, expressing itself <clears throat> in active goodness. Father, we bless you today. I ask, Lord God, that you would help us, Father, to allow you to birth and grow and mature these fruits in our lives. Father, that our lives would be exemplified by an abundance of fruit more and more each day. God, that as we learn moment by moment, step by step, to walk according to your spirit, to deny our flesh, God, your fruit would be abundant in our lives. Father, first, it would be seen and evidenced to our brothers and sisters in Christ, to those around us in the fellowship. But Father, it wouldn't stop there. It would, it would expand 
It would go out into the world. That, Father, we would have much fruit that they would look at and, and ponder and wonder and even question and bring to us. And, Father, you would give us answers that your light would shine into their lives. Father, that this body would take upon itself the Great Commission to go and preach, not forsaking words in the testimony of our lives, being faithful to give an answer when anybody asks, why do we have this hope? <clears throat> Allowing the words of our mouth to testify to the way we live our lives. Being faithful ambassadors of the message of reconciliation that you have entrusted to us. Help us, God, to be what you desire, to long for what you desire, to be active in the pursuit of everything you desire. I thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen.